Thank you very much indeed. Go Wailing Dal, Zolshong Hal, Jean Dal Neiman, Wan Gaoshing, illustrious leaders of the dairy industry of Northern Ireland. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, that was Chinese for those who don't speak it. Uh, today I'm going to speak with, uh, from three perspectives. I'm going to speak uh, from uh, my position or my involvement in the Food Strategy Board and the dairy subgroup. I'm going to uh, look at the dairy sector from my involvement with United Dairy Farmers and Dale Farm. And finally I'm going to look at it as an industrial sector from the various involvements I have in trying to promote regional economic development. So, my, my topic, I've taken the title, Creating a Successful Future, because that's what, what it's all about, trying to build a better future for ourselves, our families, and, and our community. And the key challenge for the dairy sector is economic sustainability. And by that, I mean that if you're a farmer or you're a food processor, that you can create a, not just a decent way of life for yourself, your family, or, or, or the employees in the company, but also that you can create sufficient cash flow in the business to create the, the cash for future investment and growth and to sustain the enterprise. Uh, in terms of environmental sustainability, that is almost taken as given because if you're not environmentally sustainable in today's world, you're unlikely to be economically sustainable. In, uh, in the past, the UK used to be a great shipbuilding uh, uh, industry, whether it was in, not here in Northern Ireland or in Scotland or, or North England, and they used to launch ships on a regular basis. Now we launch strategies on a regular basis, and here is a collection of various strategies uh, that have been launched over the last year in terms of the dairy sector. And each of them almost are repeating uh, the other, in the sense that Scotland, they have in their 2025 ambition strategy, have said that they want to grow their dairy sector by 50%. Uh, Wales and they're delivering growth and action plan strategy for the Welsh dairy sector are talking about 30% growth. Here in Northern Ireland we're talking about 22% growth in volume terms but we're focusing on the solids content of the milk rather than the volume. And then if we take our colleagues in Southern Ireland, our neighbours in Southern Ireland, they're talking in strategy 2020 about a 50% growth. Most competitors have similar strategies whether you're in food processing or you're in regions. And the issue here isn't your strategy, it is making your strategy happen. So the strategy is totally worthless unless somebody's doing something to action what's included in it. So that is a key issue for the dairy sector here, is actually making it happen. And we have to work as an industry, not as farmers or not as processors, as a supply chain stretching from our feed manufacturing and our farm inputs right through to the distribution companies which take our products to market. And we've got to make sure that that supply chain is aligned to the end customer or market we're seeking to supply. And we've got to ensure that we've, we've squeezed out duplication and we've optimised uh, cost across that supply chain. So if we take the going for growth strategy, and I hope that you've all read the document. I'm not going to go through this in detail. There are a number of overarching themes, and those themes apply to the dairy sector as well as other foods, <coughs> pardon me, other food sectors. Uh, and we're talking about profitable growth. There's no point in growing for the sake of growth. The only reason we want to grow is that it's going to create more profit and, and more jobs uh, and a better way of life for those involved in the industry. We've got to be more market-led. Uh, we've also got to look at how we can work better with government and optimise government's input. But it's not about handing to the government control of the sector. To be frank, if we leave the control of our sector to the government, we're going to get nowhere. We've got to take charge of what we're going to do in the industry, and then we've got to go to government with the help or for the help that we think that they can provide. So you can go down the list there in terms of the various things that the Food Strategy Board are trying to achieve, and most, if not all of them, apply to the dairy sector. If we then go more specifically into the dairy sector and we look at it in some detail before we go into the strategy, currently the dairy sector is the fastest growing part of the Northern Ireland food industry uh, and it's, it's achieving the highest sales per employee uh, employed of around £400,000 for each person employed in the sector. Uh, but it's got the lowest profit margin of any food uh, sector in Northern Ireland, where the net margin at processing level is only 1.3%. So uh, a big sector, 
at one would say a successful sector, but not one that's generating cash for future investment and not one, therefore, that has the wherewithal to, to mount a, a, a serious growth uh, challenge. The average size of our processing plants and our farms is generally smaller than GB uh, and indeed in processing smaller than Southern Ireland, though in farming we are ahead of Southern Ireland. Uh, the average size of our farm has grown substantially, and I'm going to go into that in a minute or two, but we still have much more work to do in terms of improving scale and productivity. Uh, in terms of milk solids, we have one of the lowest milk solids uh, in Europe. And that has a significant impact on our costs and our efficiency on farm and in processing. So then if we move to uh, what we're trying to achieve in the dairy sector, clearly as per the overall food strategy that we want to achieve profitable growth and we want to focus on not growing the volume of milk, what we would call in the trade white water, but growing the solids in the milk content and that actually improves the performance at a, a processing level. It means that we don't have any extra tankers. You don't need to have any, a bigger milk tank on farm. Uh, you don't actually have to do anything more but to get better, better quality milk in terms of constituents, and that will give you more powder and more cheese yield through most of the processing plants. There's significant opportunity in the world, significant opportunity for dairy products, and the future is very, very bright. That doesn't mean to say there aren't the odd challenges ahead or there won't be the odd dark day, but in general, the future is very, very bright, and there are significant opportunities. One of the biggest, which is an area that we, as an industry in Northern Ireland, aren't much involved in, is infant formula, and I'll talk about that. And we've also got to leave her more advantage from our grassland. Now, it's going to be followed by Ian, so we're going to leave that to Ian, but we're not talking here about becoming more extensive. We're talking about every farmer has grass and forage opportunities. And so by taking those and optimizing those and using the natural advantage we have with our climate, we've got to be much, much more market led and we've got to focus on managing our business, making ourselves more efficient. And also, if you're both a farmer or a processor, handling the volatility which occurs in the market. Now, early on in the, the dairy subgroup, we got into the usual wrangle between farmers and processors, and we had William Clinton, Bill Clinton was here a couple of weeks ago opening uh, the, the William Jefferson Clinton Leadership Institute at Queen's. And William Clinton and Bill Clinton talked when he was here about avoid zero-sum games. But too often in the dairy sector, we get into a zero-sum game. If a processor is making money, he must be paying a poor milk price. If the farmer is getting a, milk, uh, a good milk price, that must be at, at the penalty or at the downfall of the processor. What we've got to do is to, big, or to build or bake a bigger cake so that there's a bigger slice for everyone. And when you want to build a bigger cake, you can do it in two ways. You can grow the value added of your sales or your milk by putting more solids in it or getting better products or better markets so that you're growing the value of your output. Or you can also reduce the cost it takes to run your enterprise, whether it's a farm or processor, so that there's less of the cake being used up in costs. And basically what we're trying to do is to grow the white section, the net margin section, so that everyone in the sector can share more spoils, more for everyone, rather than this zero-sum game, because the zero-sum game and the wrangle that goes on in the industry is, is using up too much energy and deflecting us from our prime purpose. Europe exports between 7 and 10 percent of its output, which means when quotas end and um, Europe starts to expand its milk pool perhaps uh, more proactively than it has done over the last few years, all of the extra surplus is going to have to be exported. Now, some of it will find its way into the local markets, but if it does, it will have to displace other dairy products. So there are people who say, look, don't worry, you don't have to be internationally competitive we're going to supply the local market or we're going to supply the British market. It doesn't matter what market you're in. If you're not internationally competitive in the next few years, you'll be out of business because there's going to be more products from Europe chasing a home both inside Europe and outside Europe. And whether you're local, national or international, if you're not internationally competitive, you're out of business in the long term. And that holds true for farmers because the pressure will work its way down the supply chain. One of the key issues that we face in the processing sector is that we lack scale. And if you look at this chart and you look that there are eight processing companies processing 80% of Northern Ireland's milk, compared to six in Southern Ireland, compared to one in New Zealand, compared to one in the Netherlands and one in Denmark. 
Our processing operations lack serious scale, and that means we're not as cost effective, we don't have the resources, and we are fragmented as a processing sector, and that is an issue for us. We have got to get larger entities in the sector if we're going to be internationally competitive. And if we take the Porter model for international competitiveness, you've got several choices on how you can compete. You can compete in cost, and you can be cost leaders. And if you want to be cost leaders, you've got to be big, and you've got to have the economies of scale. You can focus. You can be a specialist. You can focus on things that no one else can do and do those better. And that doesn't mean uh, as big an issue for size or cost. But you've then got to be spending money on innovation. You've got to have those specialist products. Does Northern Ireland have them? The answer is no. So we're caught in the middle. We're not big and we're not specialist. And we've got to develop either scale or become more specialised or be caught in the middle and die. If we take our average herd size, the good news is if you look, our average herd size has been growing and, and growing substantially since deregulation in 95. But if you look, we still have the lowest, our smallest herd size in the UK, albeit we're bigger than in our neighbours in Southern Ireland. Again, in milk yield, you see that there's been good progress in growing the milk yield, but again, we have the lowest milk yield uh, across the UK. And if you take solid yield, we have most definitely the lowest solid yield. Again, we're slightly better than our colleagues in Southern Ireland, but that will change in Southern Ireland once quotas are removed and they no longer have had the constraints that they've been operating on. And milk supply, supply, a great story. We've been growing our milk supply and we've been growing faster than our neighbours. So we are doing something right, but we have still further work to do to catch up in terms of, of what uh, uh, the output per cow is, the output per farm, and indeed the output per processing. So if we take ourselves uh, and look at across the UK in more detail, you see that Scotland and Wales have actually been growing as well. But even though they've had the same quota opportunities as we've had here, we've been growing faster. So we have success to build on. And if we look at dairy cow numbers, we're the only region in the UK where dairy cow numbers have actually gone up. Uh, and that has meant that either fewer people have left or the people who have uh, stayed in the industry have grown at a faster rate than those leaving. Milk output per herd is a challenge for us. It has improved and it is improving, but we've got to continue to improve our output. And I would really want this ultimately to be measured as milk solids per herd. In any business where you're a farmer or a processor, you've got a number of choices. And people are making these choices every day of the week. Quite a number of people are, are choosing to get out. They don't have succession on their farm, or their farm enterprise isn't paying them a decent way, uh, a decent, decent living. Quite a number of farmers or processors are trying to get bigger or get better or get into something new. And these are the things we've got to be doing and doing continuously if we want to see a viable and prosperous dairy sector locally. You can wait for things to get better and do nothing. In my mind, if you're in that category, you're just in the get out category, but it's a slow lean of getting out. Do nothing is an excuse for getting out of business. If you look at the trends, uh, particularly at farming, they've been good. And we've been seeing, seeing continuous improvement on all the key uh, uh, performance indicators that you would use to measure productivity in farm, and hopefully Ian maybe will talk about that. But there's a huge disparity between the best and the worst. And if we could get the bottom sector of our processing or the bottom sector of our farming to move to the average, there would be a significant surge in terms of productivity and performance. Turning to the market, huge opportunity across the world. Uh, and dairy is one of the fastest growing uh, areas in terms of global, capacity, or global consumption per capita. It's, it's no uh, surprise that the growth is largely coming where the population is in, in Asia. And if you look, Western countries where we've had dairy products available for a long time are really either X growth or small growth. The growth is occurring in parts of the world where they either haven't had dairy or they haven't had the money to afford dairy protein in their diet. So one of the key drivers of growth in the world is China, but it's also one of the key threats. China is, is, is growing by a massive rate. And at the moment, it's fueling part of the, the good return that's taking place in dairy uh, markets. But there is a fear that it's stockpiling product and it's over-consuming at the moment. For example, in January, they, they imported three months output or three months consumption in two weeks in the first part of January, which is their new quota year. So much did they import in January that they exceeded their, their annual quota for New Zealand tariff in two weeks. 
which means now that all product coming into China uh, from mid-January is paying a higher quota. So there's a fear that China will slow down its purchases in the latter part of this year. But nonetheless, its purchases are massive. And with 1.3 billion people, a quarter of the world's population, now getting uh, uh, milk products for, for, uh, uh, for, their, for their daily diet, the opportunities are fantastic. If you look at where the demand is, it's largely in the BRIC countries, and if you look at where it's largely, it's in those products that you can move easily internationally. So milk powders, whey powders, and interestingly enough, cheese is catching up, and even in China, you're starting to see consumption of, of cheese, which was not in the market at all. One of the key growth areas is infant formula, and if you take the size of the Chinese market now, at 15 billion, it is four times the size of the US infant formula market and half of the global infant formula industry. Looking at the bigger picture, population growth is going to drive demand, and more and more of that population is in urban and has, has, has a higher wealth to afford better diet, and it's moving from a vegetarian diet to more of an animal protein one, and we're seeing a huge demand for water right across the world and we're seeing a number of regions in red in this map starting to suffer water stress. Uh, and if we then look at the demand for energy, both for domestic and industrial, we're starting to see uh, uh, peak energy in terms of do we have enough for everyone to share. The outcome of all of that is a huge pressure on global resources in water and energy and land. And with climate change on top of that, a real fear that droughts in a certain part of the world are really going to cause a major issue. Now, it's not an issue that we have, and it's one of our huge and natural advantages. And if you look at where dairy is in the globe, it's in the areas where there's water. And if you look at the key players, they're the areas that have the water. So in the British Isles, if you look where the rain is, it's no surprise that the dark blue areas are where all the milk production is, and we're one of those areas. Turning very briefly to a few things that we have achieved in the Food Strategy Board, the first is a commitment on the start of gas to the West, which for the food sector in total is worth about £20 million of lower cost per annum. In terms of quotas, quotas are going to end, but that means that there will no longer be any regulation and price will set out for going forward. We have a, 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 our next door neighbours, Southern Ireland, who have actually, in terms of dairy cows, four times the cows that we have but only 2.8 times the milk output. So a huge latent potential there in Southern Ireland to produce more milk. And that surge of milk that's going to occur in 2015 will have an impact on the market. And the markets have been a bit roller coaster, good though they've been in the last year. If we look at the dairy cycle of demand and supply, demand will drive the market up, but supply will drive it down. And if we look at what's caused the best markets the last number of years, They've generally been caused by adverse supply situations, weather causing supply problems. And when we look at the bad markets, they've generally been caused by oversupply, good weather resulting in too much output. So if we look at what's happened over the last number of years since 2002, you can see that whenever uh, export refunds ended in 2012-13, we started to see the world market react to supply and demand in a way it never reacted before. Prior to that, the EU managed the market. And we've seen some major peaks and troughs. There's a theory economists have that the response time in dairy is between two to three years because of lactation cycle. So at the moment, we're coming through the 2013 peak, and the markets are starting to ease off. The question is, are we going to follow the previous pattern and move down? If we look at the latest production data, it's a surge in milk supply uh, after having not had enough milk in 2012 and the early part of 2013. If we look at what's happening as a result of that surge, we're starting to see international prices fall. Coupled with the recovery in the UK is hitting the, uh, the sterling, making it more valuable against the dollar and the euro, which will reduce our prices for our produce. If we take the figures from the International Farm Comparison Network, Torsten Hema, he's predicting quite a hard fall in milk prices. His prediction, not quite mine. But the issue here is paying a competitive milk price. And if we're going to pay a competitive milk price, you can't beat the market. But you can choose what parts of the market that you are in. So you can go for markets that are less volatile, or markets that give a better return, or markets that are more stable. And we've got to make those choices and look at the seesaw of what's good and bad. So reacting to the, the adverse factors in life by, by better marketing, better innovation, and by being more competitive. 
by choosing the products that are higher in value and less volatile. Commodities have been brilliant for the last year, but over a three or four year run, commodities will be volatile and less predictable in return. If we look at market price changes, the last area to see the volatility is consumer products. Yes, it will be driven by the volatility in spot commodity markets, but it's much less volatile and a much slower process. A number of trends are, are taking place uh, in the food uh, sector, and those trends we've got to ride on, surf as it were, to make sure that, that, that our products are matching what the consumer wants, whether it's health or whether it's convenience, indulgence or whatever. Uh, there's a huge drive now against fat and dairy fat in the diet, and we've got to make sure we're responding to that in a clever way. We have seen some uh, press releases in the last week saying that dairy fat isn't bad for you, so the consumer is confused, so we've got to market our products better and be more clever about what we do. There's a number of pillars, and this is the, what we're doing in Dale Farm, on health, premium, convenience and provenance that we're building our business on. And each business has to have a market-led plan for where they want to go. Our colleagues in Southern Ireland have done a fantastic job building a regional brand. And they're taking culture, tourism and food folklore and building together a mystique for their product which we are nowhere near. Now we can maybe ride on the back of being Irish even though they're trying to lock us out. But we've got to be able to replicate that because if our near neighbours can do it, then why can't we? One of my favourite examples of innovation is Heinz, where they had the glass bottle, and the glass bottle, uh, you couldn't get your sauce out, uh, it was difficult to use. And what they did, they turned their product upside down, they put it in a plastic bottle, and they doubled the price and increased their sales by 25%. That's innovation. Innovation is something the consumer will pay more for, not necessarily in a lab. It's clever use of packaging, clever use of product. Yes, innovation also covers the science and the nutrition and the detailed, uh, 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 how would I call it, the, 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 the much more fundamental research areas. But quite often what makes money is something the consumer will pay for. The consumer will also pay for trust and safety. And a key element in, in selling to China is to show them that our products are much more safe. An in innovation capability, we're doing quite a bit. The new uh, competence centre for, for uh, uh, research for the food sector is being set up as we speak. Queen's has now launched and opened its global food security. AFP is doing quite a bit of work, which I'm sure you're going to hear about. And Invest NI is spending more than ever it did in supporting companies on innovation. The challenge is economic sustainability. It's not about being big, it's about being better and about being best. If we take a rugby analogy, we're a winning region. We're growing faster than any, any other part of Europe. But that was when we had the advantage that we had no quota constraints because we could use unused quota. Now everybody's got that advantage and we have lost it. We've got to beat the best. And I'm using the New Zealand analogy because if we're out in the world market, it's going to be Fonterra and companies like that that we've got to take on and succeed. But I believe we can all make a difference, whether you're in farming or in processing or in government. And we're all here today because collectively we think we can make a difference, we can do it better, and we can take on and beat the best in the world. It's all about working together as a team, farmers, processors, government, and their supply chain. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, I think somebody's doing up and, and